good. We uh, we had a chance to speak, I think, earlier or in 2020, but uh, great to talk to you again. And of course, the uh, the new project, which is uh, our great arc of life. Uh, great. Fantastic way, stuff. I'm Jeremy, Billy. Nice to meet you. Hey, man. Nice to meet you. I know. Listen, I'm, pull I'm pulling a Jeremy. I'm going right into it. He taught me that. He said, you just got to start. Yeah, just go right into it. So this new project, Arc of Life, you know, we're just looking at the credits and the guys that are playing on this. And, you know, it, it, this is basically like a brand new yes in a way. Uh, well, you know, it is certainly a brand new band. I mean, yes is yes and has a long legacy and history and continues to go on its journey. So but there's been a lot of satellite bands outside of yes, as you know, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, Asia conspiracy i had circa with alan and tony k and jimmy back in the day and and then you know jeff downs is doing chris braid uh, with the dba project and and steve's got his trio so there are many satellite bands around um yes the mothership but we all have time to do other things and pursue our art so yes. that's what this is really may, may i just take one second to say that dba album because I, I interviewed jeff last week is yeah. fan fucking tastic that is well, some, that is a great album and you know well, and top, by the way, top notch, so a, you know top notch musicians i'm sorry so yeah yeah, for yeah. Sure. So Arc of Life, the self-titled debut is coming out on February 12th via Frontier Records. You get it wherever music is sold. The first ever single, you make it real pretty, pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good first <laughs> put out, guys. I mean, uh, is this just a sample of what we can expect on this album? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's the first point of entry, if you will. And it's it's simple, yet it's got complexities. If you look under the hood a little deeper, you know, there's some things going on inside that song that uh, lend itself to that more proggy thing that we're all used to. Um, right. But I think that's the first good point of entry and then the album as you get into it as a listener sort of flowers and opens up as you go and becomes even more uh depth filled and textured and layered and and, and the songs get a bit longer so it's it's kind of nice i mean it's i think it's a good choice it was the label's choice and um damn label you know, it's always the label it's so funny because most most <laughs> most of my friends are i've given a you know taste to uh, to check out the song that they all say my wife loves this song. She won't stop playing it. <laughs> hey, that's good though. Come on, man. <laughs> they have to come if the wife wants to go, but it's yeah. not the other way around so much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And oh, it's true. How many how many progressive bands you know got the chicks that are digging it? So you know, <laughs> <laughs> not a bad thing. <laughs> Let me just quickly ask you, because the, the, the press release says that the whole sort of mission statement of Arc of Life is to keep the progressive rock philosophy blossoming and, and keep you know pushing boundaries. How would you describe sort of the progressive rock philosophy? What does that mean? Well, uh, to me, it means uh, a genre in music that is the most freeing to express yourself in terms of art and creativity no limitations no boundaries you're not uh bound by a structure that might come with a more poppy sort of lane to be in or um you know it's just a free form almost jazz like in its way mm -hmm. except for me you know prog i don't I don't judge it off of time lengths of songs and whatnot. I still want to hear a great song inside there. So I'm always trying to find some way to bring a sense of simplicity inside that complexity with the, the melodies and, and these hooks happening, but they're surrounded by these very strange sort of interpretations of arranging and whatnot, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Do you think that progressive rock musicians are some of the best in the world because of that? Because there's a lot well, it's, of parts that you have to remember for really long portions and pieces of music. It's it's insane. Yeah, and it's it's it's. I think it's if you're looking to expand your playing and your creativity with composition and how that affects your playing, it's definitely the the genre to explore because there are no limitations. So, uh, it it you do find more of your better players are in Prague. I mean, there's so many. The list is a mile long with all these great bands and, and individuals out there. But 
this is where they get to express all that stuff that they've been practicing forever and trying to perfect, you know? Well, let me ask you this, you know, why have an eight minute jam when you can pull four different pieces of a progressive rock song, potentially make four good, straightforward pop rock songs with them? Well, I mean, for me, it's a flow and you get into writing a song with a certain mindset and the lyrics might be expressing some particular vibe and it just feels like it needs an instrumental section after that so you can sink into what was just said and then take you out of that into the next part and hmm. kind of almost looking at it like a movie where you have a sort of beginning, middle and an end and each one is a scene inside the film. So it's just a matter of how long does this scene go before it gets boring? And, right. and is it is it entertaining, you know, and is it still holding your imagination the whole Are time? Are you saying yeah. that this Arc of Life album is eventually going to turn into a motion picture? Mm. That'd be great. Well, I always tend to think of music <laughs> as kind of, you know, a movie for your ears. So, mm. you know, I've often said that in terms of a lot of the records I make or, you know, if you put some headphones on and just give it, the time to, to just sit there in a, in a dark room or staring off into space, wherever you are doing whatever you like to take, taking you away into another place for a while. And that's something that I think the younger generation, those who are discovering what we already know as this wealth of music in the prog genre, new fans discovering it are like, they're just, their eyes are opening up to this other world. They had no idea because they've been sort of, you know, brainwashed into these seven second chunks of time and sound bites and things that should be over in 10 seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you this. Frontiers is known for, for melodic rock. They're, they're known for throwing bands together. And, and a lot of those bands just exist on album. They don't go out and tour for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Is this one of these where you're just thrown together for this project and we get it out there, you do a few interviews and merci, bonsoir, or does it become a band that is going to tour? And then when Yes in Asia say, listen, no mass, we're done. Does this sort of fill the void? Well, we definitely have the intent to go forward and play live and take it to a stage as soon as there's a stage to go to, um, you know, so well, they're, they're all open in Florida. Yeah, there's no COVID. <laughs> uh, Haven't you heard about well, it? Yeah, Florida's well, COVID free, don't you know? Uh, <laughs> no, but, whenever it does come back, we're sort of ready on the starting line to pull the right. trigger and put it all in place. Uh, fortunately for us, our management is the same of Asia and yes, so their calendars of all the things we're sort of interweaved in can get worked out without conflict and um, right. Got a great agency and TKO ready to go. So, you know, we're just. But is this the band or is it a project? Oh, it's definitely a band. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. it's a band in the way that I'm still a band member of Circa. And, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, Asia, it's, it's a band. It's a band of brothers that wants to uh, do more together and, and do all the aspects that come with it as opposed to a, a project that's more studio oriented. And you. I mean, I do plenty of those where I'm, I'm pulling in left, right and center people. And, you know, there's just no way that that's going to get on a stage. Realistically, it's mm -hmm. logistic out of control. But when you do put a band together, you sort of, you know, before you say you're a band, you, you have that one talk of like, look, when it comes time to play live, you're ready to do this. Right. And, and as long as the answer is yes, then we're on our way, you know. Right. Let me ask you um, a bit of a nerdy question here. You know. As a musician who plays in this genre, how do you go and like, how do you guys go about crafting a song? Because, you know, progressive, obviously progressive music has a lot of different parts and elements when it comes to the arrangement of these tunes and different things. You know, how does a song like that for a band like yours start? Does it start with a guitar riff? Does it come, does it start with like a synth pad and somebody starts soloing over it or like, like how does a song happen for you guys? Well, I know from my own experience writing, it happens in many different ways. Sometimes I'll hear a drum groove in my head and I'll run over to the computer and, and just jot that down and sketch it and come back to it and develop it into something. Or a lot of times I'm working on sessions for other artists, other people, and as I'm getting the sound, my bass sound together, um, just to listen back to something, make sure it's good, I might play and start noodling on something and I'll 
if I like it, I'll grab that file, put it on the desktop in a folder I have called Ideas. <laughs> it's and, fine. And so I, I'm constantly kind of pulling from different areas. I might be in my car and hearing a melody. You know, You Make It Real was one of those songs for me where I was driving in the car and just kind of heard, you make it real. And I thought, so I sang that into my phone and kind of sang the song, majority of what we had right there as an idea. But then you take it to uh, the next level and you start really sketching your song out and arranging it and whatnot. But the ideas come from from different places of inspiration. It's weird. You know, I might hear something from uh, a television news report that'll set my mind off on something or, you know, as the case was with the song Siri on the record, you know, I was finishing a, a gig with yes somewhere over there in england and i got back to my hotel after kind of you know enjoying hospitality a bit and uh, asked my phone you know siri can you set the alarm for 7 30 a.m and she said yes your alarm is set i said thank you she said you're welcome and i started bantering back and forth with this thing <laughs> and before i knew it i was asking it strange things like you know do you dream? And it said electric sheep, but only sometimes. And I was like, wow, that's trippy. Um, <laughs> and, and then I asked it, do you love? And it said, who me? And, and kind of right around that time, I was like, wow, this is a song. Hang on. <laughs> what am hey, I I'm going hey, to write one right now. No, hold on. You know, and <laughs> so it's kind of strange where things come from, but I, I try to let all of the spigots remain open and whatever water flows, I try to catch it. <laughs> what right. I can't. Oh, yeah. interesting, man. Well, you make yeah. it real. Brand new self titled debut record is coming out on uh, Frontiers Records February 12th to get it now uh, wherever music is sold. I want what's that really cool red, like maroon Telecaster ish guitar you got in the background there? Mm. It's got a funky that, headstock. And yeah, that's my main guitar that I've played and loved forever since I started endorsing Carvin, which, um, right. you know, the, regime change has happened now so it's a different story but back in the day um you know uh, chris and i both endorsed carbon and that that's my main telly it's got a, a built-in vg pickup to send a synths and you know i have a lot of different guitars but that's the one that's like my main that, it's just a telly model carbon's telly model it sounds great plays great double octave love it Nice. Let, me, let me ask you uh, just real quick, because you obviously uh, have done the stuff with Asia and the done, the, you know, yes, Chris yeah. Squire and John Wetton, uh, mm -hmm. two of the greatest to have ever graced a stage. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like for you going in there and playing their parts? Do, do, do you learn from that? You go, wow, I didn't know you could do that. And, and do, does it make you a better player? And how are they similar? How are they different? And what do you bring to the mix? Mm. Well, I, I had, you know, studied Chris's stuff since I was 14, 15. A, a master. Yeah, I was very well versed on his whole trip. I mean, we used to sit around at his crib and, and uh, you know, we'd start talking about Silent Wings of Freedom, for instance. And I would say, yeah, you know that one part I've always dug the way the bass. And he's like, is that what I did? That is what I did. <laughs> you know, so I had it pretty well down, you know. Uh, and it's no secret, he was my, you know, sort of hero, sort of go-to guy. Wetton, you know, I, I've been following Wetton through Crimson, UK, Asia, you know, all of the outlets that John was involved with. And then I ended up working with him on Raising Captivity, getting to be able to co-write the record and, and produce it. So I got up close and personal with him, you know. I wasn't as close with John as I was with Chris, but John and I were definitely close. And uh, so to be able to, you know, have them ask me to do what I'm doing is is an honor that I never fathomed in a million years, you know, and I don't take it lightly. I, I, I defend that position with my life because, you know, these guys wanted these things to continue. And that's one of the things Chris kept saying towards the end is just make sure it keeps going on. So, you know, I'm, I'm in for the long run to keep these things going. As far as the playing of each guy, Chris's style is completely different than John's, you know, but what's interesting in it is their, their approach to the compositions of the parts, you know, Chris is like, he's all over the map, you know, right. John, John's thing is more in a central area, but the notes themselves are pretty damn cool the way he's got them worked out. So uh, especially a lot of that UK stuff, you know, <clears throat> hey, so can't go wrong with that stuff. 
but it is definitely a different approach. You know, it's a, it's a different approach. Um, bass is a funny thing because, you know, a lot of people who might not be able to identify the bass in a mix, they just hear music as music. Mm. They, they're, they're sort of uh, not really getting the beauty of understanding what a, a bass, you know, like a, when a Paul McCartney plays a bass line, mm. what that's doing to the song. You or know? Listen, I'm going to throw out Tom Hamilton you can talk all you want about Aerosmith and say, Joe Perry's this and Steven. You take out Tom Hamilton from Walk This Way, sweet. Those songs fall apart. Well, and, you know, going even further and deeper into the, the who I, you know, to me, Jocko. You know what I mean? Yeah. With, Pistorius. Yeah. And that was a funny thing with, with Chris and I, because, you know, there, there was this one time we were on the road and, and the gigs over, we're at a bar somewhere having drinks and getting loaded. And he looks over and he goes... <laughs> Just admit it, I'm your favorite bass player, he says to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're I like, said, yeah. I used to tell him, you're so close. <laughs> and he would look at me and go, Jocko, right? And I'd say, yeah. Yeah. So, tell him about Jocko. You know, bass is, a, is an interesting uh, component to that. And I've Here, let, me, let me just bring to, it both guys different for sure different. let me just bring it to the modern day then with an arc of life you, you do have the yes alumni with you so do you have to sort of pay homage to those guys and, and give it a bit of their sound or do you just say no 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 this is billy's sound and at this point what is billy's sound because you've played the other guys for so long do you know yeah. where it's, uh, that line is well i mean it's a weird thing because for me, like as, as role models of producing uh, in the way that Chris is my hero for being a bass player, my role models for producing, you know, my heroes were Hugh Padgham, our Hugh Padgham, you know, he made so many amazing albums and I can hear a record and know that it's Hugh Padgham, you know, we, I can just right. hear like, him. Well, like, you know, it's Mutt Lang, you, you, you or hear Mutt it. Or Eddie. So in a weird way, you know, I've become known as this sound that I bring to the table. And, you know, it, it, when that started, I was, it sort of almost rubbed me wrong. It's like, what do you mean? You know, I, I, I'm bringing these other guys to the table. And finally, I was just like, yeah, that's my sound. <laughs> let's go with it. <laughs> Take it or leave it. This is Billy. Yeah, hell <laughs> was, well, let's call it that. Um, since you're but talking I about do, I, the, the other guys, though, you know, it's not just me doing everything. So I'm I'm engineering things and hearing tone the way I hear it. But that's John Davison singing. And you can tell. And he just sounds like a bird. And, you know, Jimmy's guitar playing is shredding. I'm just yeah. kind of, you know, engineering it in a way where I get it into my comfort zone. And I guess that does have a sound at this point, you know, all these years later. Absolutely. Let me ask you just real quick. You and I lost a friend in common uh, not too long ago in Bob Kulik. Oh, um, yeah. Talk to me about Bob, because you did a lot of those tribute records with him. And he, he, you know, he, he was on all these records, whether it's Kiss or Meatloaf and all, and yet he never got to be the guy at the front that everybody went, oh, he's the guitar hero. And yet he was. Yeah. Um, just quickly talk to me about Bob and working with him and, and, and what he meant to you. Well, Bob was a very special guy. And uh, we met through a mutual record company friend and we started producing records together. I had a studio in Van Nuys where I made ultimately Keys to Ascension and the Open Your Eyes records mm -hmm. and some Motorhead stuff in there. Um, Rat, there was a ton of the stuff that went on at that studio. But Bob kind of, we started working together and, and we got along together. We laughed about a lot of the same stuff. I obviously an amazing guitar player. And, you know, as you said, I don't think got the due that he was deserved. Um, but he certainly left a mark in terms of all the things that he's left behind to listen to. That's for sure. And, you know, he was just a New York guy, you know, to know Bob was to love him. You know, he called me uh, when the, the, the Yankees played the Dodgers out here, you know, mm -hmm. and he's like, man, what the hell of a night last night. I'm like, what's up? He goes, I paid 500 bucks for two tickets to sit there. And I said, yeah, he goes, I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm a Yankees fan, man. So like I'm rooting and he says, the guy turns around to me and it turns into a scene and I'm escorted up. <laughs> and I thought to myself, only Bob could go to a baseball game and pick a fight with all of LA. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. I wonder if he won the fight and B, if he was blasting Sweet Victory as he was being dragged out. <laughs> exactly, right? It's all about Sweet Victory. Oh, That's well, I just. Probably my- that's probably my favorite thing that happened with Bob, actually, is that we did that SpongeBob, that silly SpongeBob uh, Are you, episode. Did you play which, on that, or did you you worked on that with him? Well, I mixed it for him. Oh, uh, wow. Dude, yeah. can I just say, that is like the soundtrack to my childhood, because what... Yeah, now, keep in mind here, uh, Jeremy's only 26, so he grew up, literally, yeah. watching SpongeBob. Well, you know, when my kid was growing up, SpongeBob was all the rage. You know, he's 18 now, so, you know... Uh, I, and so the day that it came on, I kind of looked at him and I'm like, you digging this? <laughs> Dude, it's, 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 That's it's daddy. The daddy <laughs> did that. It's the drum fill in there. Do, 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 do. Brown. Like, it's just right. so good. And, Who and was the, the drummer on that? You've got, you've. Um, I don't remember how the track. Uh, uh, I know it was David Glenn Isley sang. David Glenn Isley sang. Bob was on there. Oh, you mixed it. The drums could have yeah. been programmed. Yeah, uh, they might have been. I think we got the files before files. I say files, it was tape back then. Yeah, but we probably got the tape before I, I saw how it was created, you know. But yeah, funny, funny. Yeah, no, I'm funny. trying to see if I can find out who it was, but I can't see it here. Uh, I'm not... They're probably oh. programmed, man. They, they just sound so good. And like that, uh, no, here it is. It says, uh, Patrick Star Electric Drums. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, that's Patrick Star. <laughs> From the from the TV show, it's from the TV perfect. show, of course. Perfect. <laughs> Mitch is like acting like as if there was a big revelation. Oh, it was Patrick no. Score. No, no, that's what I was doing. Uh, yeah. Just real quick, you, you did of course do uh, some stuff with uh, with uh, Lemmy and and the Motorhead guys. Uh, mm-hmm. Just what was that experience like? Did, did they come in? Did, you know, when you produce a Motorhead track, are you actually producing it, or do you just or does this Lemmy just go? This is how it fucking works. Leave me alone. Like, uh, well, you know, as a producer, part of your gig is to hold the line if something's right. going really sideways. Uh, but, you know, those guys knew what they were doing and I knew what I was doing. And of course, uh, I came into that through Phil Carson, who was the president of JVC at the time. <clears throat> and, you know, Phil gave me a great rep going in. So there was a bit of respect, obviously, that went in there. And we just kind of went in and got on with it and came out with quite a cool track. I mean, Hellraiser's pretty ballsy in your face track. And then I do, we did one more uh, track with them. I think it was called hell on earth or something. Uh, that was a bonus track for the film, but, uh, just a trip, you know, Lemmy was, he was larger than life and, 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 you know, he was the real deal, you know? He'd show up to the studio with a thirsty two ounce of, of Jack Daniels with oh, a yeah. taste of Coke in there, and off we go. <laughs> you needed. Well, you needed. <laughs> well, listen, uh, th- there was one time in Montreal where I was his driver, and I had to drive him around to the gig in the hotel, and he had two 40 ounces of vodka. And yeah. by the end of the night, by, before the show started, he finished the one in the right hand. And by the end of the night, he finished the one. And he was perfectly sober. He was perfectly straight. He played the gig. And I was just sitting there going, that would have killed half of us here. What the (laughs) fuck? The most interesting thing I found was is that his knowledge of World War II stuff, because he was like a World War II historian. Total buff, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for as many of those Jack Daniels or whatever he'd have in his hand, he could tell you, you know, who died in 1944 at Anzio. You know what I mean? It was it was pretty, pretty interesting to sit around and talk with him about that stuff. Yeah, I remember watching that doc in his apartment just full of like Nazi memorabilia and stuff. And I'm like, this dude was obsessed with it, you know? Well, he once showed up at my place real excited to show me a Hitler youth knife and put it on the console. And I said, dude, I'm Jewish. If you don't mind, could you get that thing the fuck out of here? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Imagine he just showed up in full Hitler regalia, like cosplay. Right? (laughs) That would have been funny. Uh, oh, yeah. Billy, let me ask you this just real quick before we, you know, have to wrap up. Since you're a producer and everything, and you know, you, you'd be a good person to ask this. Do you think that modern mastering of music is shit? With the brick mm-hmm. wall limiter and compression and mastered for iTunes and everything. Do you think well, well the mastered for iTunes is a is is just awful? Well, yeah. But, well, but- I, I think that you know what I learned early on was how important mastering is and how important the mastering guy is and your relationship with him and 
Yeah. And so in my career, I've been fortunate enough that, you know, um, Joe Gaswert was the guy that I would go to for forever. And Joe, you know, was all about keeping those dynamics at the rate of not being as hot of a CD and all that stuff. Hmm. Um, and then uh, I began working with more Applebaum, who has that same concept of keeping the dynamics pure and true. Mayor so is the terrific. Is think, the problem is, I think that, you know, you've got to be of the mindset that you want it the way we're talking about. And your mastery engineer has to understand that and maintain it uh, versus a label and young musician saying it's not loud enough. Right. Because that's what it really comes down to. You know, it's a competition of like when you're in your cars. Yeah, it's it's, a, like, vol it's a volume war. That. But that they, you know, you, I guess, too, it, the genre is important to consider in that regard, too. Because if you just got these wall of guitars and it's just this three piece of power guitar based drums thing, you can hit that wall and it almost won't make a whole hell of a lot of difference anyway. Right. But if you're talking about, you know, awaken for instance and you're trying to maintain this thing then you have to air a little under that line and work in the dynamics and let the listener just turn it up a little bit you know that's what i always used to say it's like just turn it up yeah well you know? a, i i heard a funny story from the late great mike shipley and he was working on a record with mont lang for a band called maroon five and so they finished they spent like you know three or four weeks just mixing the mixing the stuff and they sent it off to mastering and some lackey at the label just ended up doing the mastering and when they got it back they were like this is disgraceful like well it's funny how that step it's not funny it's dangerous how that step can just destroy all of your hard work yeah so my why it's you got to have a trust you know and and mayor again you know is like I've got such a trust with him now that, you know, he'll bug me to listen to make sure it's okay. I'm like, dude, I spent six months working on the record. I'm sure it's okay. And then it just goes <laughs> off to the mastering guy in the, in the studio and it's just like, oh, let's just wipe out all of their bottom end. They spent like months <laughs> crafting. Exactly. It's a dangerous proposition. And, you know, the thing is just like everything is about recording. I mean, you know, recording used to be sort of an art form that you had to learn and really respect and understand to get the best of. Yeah. Now it's kind of like, just wing it, go for it. So yeah. in, in the same regard, everyone is a mastering engineer by proxy because you can buy these mastering programs, but they- so an L1 so on the master bus if you're done. So, you know, I've always gone elsewhere because, you know, I know what a critical step that is and how important it is and, and yeah. what that means to the whole project. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a shame that remastering now has just basically meant we're putting out the CD again, but just really loud. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but that's not remastering. I, mean, I, listen, <laughs> I listen to everything I want to listen to from that first generation that was what they wanted when they wanted it in that technology field working inside that parade, you know what I mean? That's how I like to listen to the stuff I like to listen to. That's it, you know, and like yeah. like you said, you can always just turn it up. Exactly, just turn it up. <laughs> and it's not a lot, but it, it, it gives you the dynamic, you know, that's where else are you gonna get that dynamic from, you know? Well, you're gonna be able to turn up all the dynamics of Arc of Life, their new album, you make it real, February 12th. Go pick it up, everybody, it's gonna be awesome. There you go. Thank you yeah. for having me, man. This has been a fun time. So, thank you, Bailey. Always, always a pleasure. Yeah, this was yes, a fun sir. conversation. I enjoyed this. <laughs> right on, man. Well, we'll see you when we get out on the road. Once there's a road to be on. Yes, and <laughs> and, and 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 keep in mind that he plays with Jay Shellen, who of course was in Hurricane. So that yes, is a was. great that is a he great had, thing right there. He had the hair to prove it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Great, great band. I mean, hey, it, Kelly Hansen went enough, on to. He had enough hair back then for the whole band right now. We could spread <laughs> it around. It'd be okay. I'll, I'll take some. I'll take some. I could take some too, actually. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Billy. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so All much. Right, See you guys. Yeah. Cheers. Great to meet you. Later, guys. Cheers.